Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Now we tried this before once, so it didn't work very well. Let's try again. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Good Excellent. By the end of the morning, we've got this one whole sussed out. Um, yeah, do feel free to uh, carry on uh, picking up the beers. Uh, this is this is not a school day. Uh, this is a day out. So beer and tanks in this context are allowed to mix. It's absolutely fine. Uh, the, uh, you, you, no, no one's watching. Trust me. Um, I'm delighted uh, to welcome our second speaker. The Tank Museum, as I'm sure many of you know, um, is not merely about the technology. We are the core museum of the Royal Armoured Corps. And we are the regimental museum of the Royal Tank Regiment, the world's oldest tank regiment, the world's indeed first tank regiment. And Bobbington is the home of the tank and is the traditional home of the Royal Tank Regiment. And our next speaker is going to bring us up to date about what the British Army is doing with tanks now and a bit of a glimpse into what the future might look like. And it gives me tremendous pleasure this morning to welcome our speaker, the current commanding officer of the Royal Tank Regiment, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jim Howard. I'm glad I was correctly introduced there, so just to be clear, I'm not an SS reenactment, this is still uh, what we wear on a daily basis for, for a lot of tank crews. And also, just to be clear, reference the comments about uh, beers and tanks mixing for a couple of officers we've got, they definitely don't, uh, and this is not a trend I'd like to start. Um, so, uh, in way of introduction, it is a huge honour for me to come and talk to you here today. Um, as uh, was mentioned, we've got a great uh, reputation and uh, link with the Tank Museum, uh, and something I feel very passionately about. My name uh, is Lieutenant Colonel Jim Howard. I joined the Army in the year 2000, um, and I'm currently the Commanding Officer of the Royal Tank Regiment, which is one of only three regiments left in the British Army that is currently operating the Challenger 2 main battle tank, uh, which is a system uh, that's going to be kept in service until 2035 with a series of upgrades that are just around the corner. As some of you might know, uh, the Royal Tank Regiment is the, uh, the first uh, and the oldest tank regiment in the world, uh, and as such, um, we have always led the way on armoured vehicle development. In fact, we recently celebrated the uh, 100th anniversary of the Battle of Combray, which was the first mass use of tanks in World War I, and there's some great examples in the museum. So it's fantastic to have the opportunity to give my view on the utility of tanks, both today and in the future. Can anyone not hear me? Okay, going well. Um, so, over the next 20 minutes, I hope to highlight how we're going to use tanks today by explaining some of the threats that we face, um, the role of tanks in countering those threats, the strengths and weaknesses of the alternative to tanks and how they can be used, um, and how they might fill a similar role to armour itself. And then I'll look at outlining the utility of tanks in the future, and after that, um, I'll open up the floor to Q&A, probably have a bit of sort of 10 or 15 minutes, and I'm really happy to talk about anything on the presentation, the regiment in general, or just some sort of tank chat. So, um, since the tanks uh, were first used in September 1916, in the Battle of the Somme, uh, its perceived utility has largely ebbed and flowed. From a high point in the Second World War, to seemingly, at least from a British perspective, uh, having far less utility in uh, military operations in Afghanistan. So at the moment, tanks, I think, are a currency that is increasing in value, due to, I believe, two key factors. First of all, the proliferation of main battle tanks around the world, uh, both in terms of quantity. So for those of you who are keen, you can pop out to Eastern Europe, and if you know the right companies, you can pick up a fully operational T-72 for a snip over £35,000. Um, but also in terms of quality, for example, Russia's willingness to sell and export T-80s and the T-90 systems. Secondly, we face threats, uh, some of them today are from an insurgent Russia in Eastern Europe with a large number of armoured vehicles and uh, conventional forces. And then we've also got a Middle East organisation, terrorists, uh, by the name of ISIS, I imagine you've heard of them. They too are equipped with main battle tanks, uh, but some are more credible than others, granted. If you can't see, um, that's one of the sort of bodge jobs of uh, an up-armoured bulldozer that's had a couple of machine guns, gaffer tanks to it, and some armour plating. But everyone's still got the idea of armour and they're trying to use it. And so in this context, the primary, uh, but not single role of tanks, is still uh, shock action, concentrating that armoured force uh, to attack weak spots at an unintended time and an unintended place, certainly from the enemy's perspective. 
And this is achieved through an appropriate combination of mobility, firepower and protection. And you'll probably hear that over and over again. Mobility, firepower and protection. And that's the triangle of what makes a tank. It also includes aggressive mobile action, which is aimed at destroying enemy armour, surveillance, target acquisition and uh, exploitation. And ultimately, tank forces will allow you to manoeuvre over large areas and provide a 24-7, uh, all-weather, all-environment anti-armour capability. Um, but, as I said, there are some real alternatives to armour these days, um, and that's not to say that tanks are the only way to counter the threats that we might be facing. So tanks have some big downsides, and it's worth acknowledging them. First of all, significant resupply uh, and logistic demands exist in a time where, on most governments' lists of the military forces, value for money is quite high up. So if you're expensive, it's not so good. Um, and they really are expensive. And we live in a society today where convincing people there is a genuine threat that is worth spending a lot of money on is quite tricky. Um, there's a great quote from the late Sir Richard Holmes. You probably can't see it, so I'll read it to you. And he said, Given a choice between a single tank and 176 kidney dialysis, dialysis machines, we might well choose the latter. However, the decision might have been very, very different in 1940. So it's all about the context and the society you live in and your perception of threat and what you should be spending your money on. Um, tanks are constrained in built up urban areas as that sort of becomes a quick 360 battle, which is not great for a vehicle that tends to have all of its armour loaded towards the front of the vehicle. Um, and poor old tanks have got a bit of an image problem to make it worse as well. Governments are quite often reluctant to deploy heavy battle tanks because of the perception that it's, over, it's uh, overzealous, heavy handed uh, and the population will respond badly. Alternatives to armour include the use of air power, and you can't see it but that's one of the Russian gunships. Uh, the new generation of these are regularly offered as the new solution to overcome tanks. Um, but, as this quote from a commander of the Iraqi tank battalion in 1991 highlights, the effectiveness of air power against armour is often limited. And again, you probably can't read this, so what he says is, this is an individual who started the war with 38 T-72s. After 28 days of the air war, I was down to 32 T-72s. After 20 minutes, with a second armoured cavalry regiment, I was down to none. So you can see the difference. So attack helicopters can hit multiple targets from very far away, that's great, but they can't hold ground due to limited loiter time, um, their high maintenance requirements, um, and also whilst good for precision strikes, they can't take the objective and they can't hold the objective. Because ultimately, to do that, you need to be on it, not hovering uh, above it or a couple of miles away. Um, and then lastly, we sort of talked about value for money. Um, the average Apache helicopter is roughly about 10 times more expensive than a Challenger 2, so they fail them too. Um, traditionally, tanks are very vulnerable to handheld anti-tank weapons, and both anti-tank weapons of the handheld variety and the guided variety uh, are becoming more easily concealed as they get smaller. And you've got something called soft launch missiles, which means they don't have the back blast. The big advantage of that is you can fire it from inside a building, so making them even more deadly. But if you are a dismounted anti-tank team, you are slow to manoeuvre across the battlefield uh, and you're extremely vulnerable to pretty much everything, not to mention artillery uh, through indirect fire. Defensive aid suites or active countermeasures, you might have heard these as uh, called DAS. You might be able to see that on there, hopefully you can see a bit of it. But these are effectively fitted on the next generation of uh, US and Russian tanks. So what it is, it's a clever system that identifies a projectile coming in, fires a device at it and defeats the projectile before it has the time to strike the tank uh, and do any damage. Um, but these are importantly designed to defeat projectiles travelling at somewhere between 70 and 700 metres per second, which is basically your missiles. Uh, and in there you've got javelin, RPGs, tow missiles and hellfires. What they're not so good at doing is defeating kinetic energy profiles, um, sorry, projectiles, which is fired from the barrel of the main battle tank, because these are travelling in the region of over two kilometres a second, and that makes it a lot harder to defeat. So for me, this suggests that the old adage that it takes a tank to defeat a tank still remains valid, and so whilst any potential adversary is still investing in tanks, it makes all the sense in the world that we as a nation should also be investing in our own tank forces. So why do I think tanks remain such an important part of any modern formation? Firstly, it keeps me in a job, and clearly that's my, uh, the most important thing from my perspective. Um, and then secondly, it is all about the utility and flexibility that tanks provide. That's really important. 
So as previously mentioned, it's not just about achieving that shock action, uh, enhancing surveillance and target acquisition. They're highly mobile uh, and they can exploit opportunities, but also they can support conventional light wall forces. And this is really important. The presence of armor can reduce infantry casualties, both by drawing fire, providing fire support, and offering, offering protection to dismounted infantry. And the experience of Israeli Defense Force uh, in 2002 was that basically the presence of armor as part of your force uh, is invaluable to reducing infantry casualties, which is really important if you're not in a big army that's prepared to throw people away. So if you can't afford to take a lot of casualties, and most armies are like that now, you need tanks. Also, whilst logistic burdens are a factor, they're not a showstopper. Certainly, my regiment's experience in Basra is that you can move a group of tanks across formation boundaries, attach them to another unit with minimal logistic impacts. However, if you are an Iraqi position defending and suddenly a single troop of tanks turns up and you've not prepared for tanks, the effect those tanks will have on those light forces is absolutely disproportionate and fantastic value. Um, and also, they can provide a good deterrent. Again, were you able to see this? What you would see was a Danish Leopard 2 parked on top of the hill uh, in Helmand province in Afghanistan. Uh, one of the big no-nos in, in terms of a tank skylining, but it's doing it anyway. And the reason why is in counterinsurgency operations, um, putting yourself in overwatch on top of the hill, certainly in Afghanistan, deterred the Taliban from getting involved in an area or interfering with coalition uh, operations. As highlighted by quotes from General Mills of the US Marine Corps, who was commanding Helmand in 2010, he says, tanks bring superior optics, maneuverability, precision firepower that enable us to isolate insurgent forces from the key population centers and provide the ability to project power into where the insurgent thinks he is safe. So what does the future battlefield look like? Again, another slide, and what we've got here is open rolling country, and then down here, a really cluttered, congested mega city. And with populations increasing in big cities, these are basically where the objectives are going to lie and so where the fighting is probably going to take place. Um, you've seen a number of examples of where the vulnerability of armour in cities has been exploited by the area. Grozny is a great example. Grozny is quoted by the UN, it's one of my favourite stats, as the most destroyed city in the world. That's quite a stat from something like the UN. Um, and when you look at how the Russians operated here, you had a, uh, a large armoured force currently uh, using their prestige tank of the time, so the T-80, um, and they were defeated by a lightly armed insurgent force supported by the local populace. So it didn't go particularly well. But with the necessary planning uh, and the appropriate force package, so that's tailoring your, uh, your armed group that goes into the city, um, especially combining armor and infantry, there is a clear role for armor fighting in urban areas. And again, this was demonstrated by the US Marine Corps in Fallujah, Again, a lot of similarities to Gosney. So you've got a pretty heavily damaged city, you've got a large armed force, you've got their prestige vehicle at the time, so the M1 Abrams, and they're up against a lightly armed insurgency that's supported by the population. The difference is massive success. Um, and the main reason for this is using that force package and making sure rather than just bussing tanks in at speed, you're putting the infantry with them, you're putting the engineers with them, so you've got a nice rounded capability and you're not going to get caught out. As the Danish commander for uh, their urban operation training wing says, to fight and win in cities, the attacking side must have the ability to reach forwards, strike selectively, secure the key points, and recover elements quickly. Main battle tanks can do this with a combination of survivability, speed, firepower, lethality, sustainability, and uh, shock effect. Armour also allows groups to be either created, and you do this either by driving through walls or using the main gun to create a hole in the wall, or you can clear routes by physically driving over the obstacles or driving through IED belts, as was proven in Afghanistan and Iraq. You can clear your own route with a tank. You can also create new points of entry into buildings for the dismounted infantry, and the use of main armour certainly helps achieve surprise, as there are a few things more surprising in life as a high explosive shell coming through the window of the building that you're in. Um, tanks can achieve intimate fire support without collateral damage implications of indirect fire, so that's the artillery, um, which ultimately creates obstacles and creates cover from the enemy. So I go back to Grozny, and what you had in Grozny, the Russians shelled it to bits, and all they did was create a lot of obstacles for their own forces going in there, and then they created a lot of cover for the lightly armed insurgent forces to hide amongst uh, and damage them as they went past. 
Um, so whilst there are a few issues, you've got the barrel length problem. So if you're driving down a thin street, again, somewhere like Bowser, and you're trying to move the gun left and right, having a long barrel is not a great thing. Um, and there is some sort of uh, weight constraints. It's important not to exaggerate these constraints. The key is to understand. So for example, Challenger 2 weighs 70 tonnes. However, it's got a lower ground pressure per square inch than your average car. So when you are driving through cities and you're worried about subterranean structures, sewer systems, and all the rest of it, actually, tanks are no best thing. And ultimately, the success of tanks in cities is largely dependent on understanding that threat, proper planning, and then making sure you've got the appropriate task group going in. So again, you try and rush in a load of tanks, you're taking a risk. If you've got infantry and engineers to support you, it's probably gonna go a lot better for you. So I'm so disappointed you can't see this slide. It's a sort of hybrid of an Apache and a Challenger 2. Uh, it's a great picture. But I want to talk now a little bit about sort of enhancing the utility of armor for the future. So how do we take advantage of the technology, the tank technology we've got available today, without having to start from scratch um, and develop a new armor vehicle? Because we're not in the business of doing that, and we couldn't afford to even if we wanted to do it. So given the cha uh, challenging financial circumstances, how do we do it in a way that is affordable? So what I'm going to do now is briefly outline some of the ideas you could use to adapt the tank, enhance its utility. And this is definitely not an exhaustive list. This is just something the RTR have been playing with. Um, hopefully it will promote a bit of debate uh, and then maybe we can talk a bit further in Q&A afterwards. But then, um, as demonstrated previously by Lieutenant Colonel Percy Hobart, uh, later Major General Percy Hobart DSO, in 1942, he modified a number of service vehicles who were then called Hobart's Funnies. And if you haven't seen these, there's a brilliant collection in the main hall. Um, you have got uh, things like the, um, uh, the duplex drive Sherman that allowed the tanks to swim ashore on D-Day. You've got the Centaur bulldozer, the Crab mine flail, the Buffalo amphibious troop carrier, the Churchill crocodile. There's a whole spread of these modified vehicles that were tweaked to do a very, very unique role. Um, and by doing this, they overcame the threats and challenges that they faced at the time in World War II. So firstly, we need to be prepared to adapt our tanks. Um, one of the trickiest things we face is how do we integrate all the feeds from UAVs, drones, uh, unmanned ground vehicles and acoustic sensors. There's a whole host of clever stuff out there on the battlefield that's just trying to throw information at you, be it sort of video footage from 30,000 feet, acoustic stuff telling you where the enemy artillery is firing and so on and so on. So is it feasible perhaps to have unmanned ground vehicles or a drone hovering along with every tank, either in the sky or next to it? Um, could you do something to allow the crew to look ahead and around corners, possibly to identify threats before you physically get there? Um, and in the future, given the advances made in unmanned vehicles, um, such as the one used by the Iraqi security forces in Mosul, and again, that looks like a big vehicle, it's about that tall, it's got a missile launcher and a 20mm cannon on it and it drives around remote control causing havoc. So with this you could argue that with all these information feeds uh, that are there to support tank crews it's going to make you better. But I think there's a real risk with all this additional information that you basically end up overwhelming the tank crews and you might actually make them less effective. Um, there's a great quote, I'll read it out to you if you can't see it. Um, this was in World War II, uh, and it's even more tricky now. It's from a commander of an M3 Grant, and basically what he says is, uh, he's obviously in action, he says the 75mm main gun is firing, the 37mm secondary gun is firing, but it's traversed around the wrong way, the Browning machine gun is jammed, I'm shouting driver advance on the A set, but the driver, who can't hear me, is reversing. And as I look over the top of the turret and see 12 enemy tanks just 50 yards away, someone hands me a cheese sandwich. <laughs> and it is that sort of complexity, certainly for the commander, of two different radios, the intercom, trying to control the gun system, all the rest of it. So there's a risk if you then feed in additional complexity, uh, you're going to derail it. Um, the other thing we need to overcome is the friction between uh, the infantry on the ground uh, and those mounted and armoured vehicles, particularly in complex terrain, because this is a real problem. And we really do struggle sometimes with things like target identification, avoidance of blue on blue, and making situational awareness really, really difficult. Um, you may or may not be aware of a project called Street Fighter that the regiment is working on. 
Uh, it's been in sort of social media quite a lot. Uh, if you go on Facebook and have a look at the regimental uh, site, Royal Tank Regiment, hope you're following it, I'll, I'll check afterwards. Um, we've used a single Challenger 2 tank uh, and we started welding stuff to it and putting bits and bobs on, much to the concern of Army headquarters, but we've, uh, we've come a long way with it. But what's unusual about this particular prototype tank is none of the ideas are from Army headquarters, none of the ideas are from the, uh, the Ministry of Defence. All the ideas, and they are the best ideas, have come from our soldiers who work on the tank park and use the tank every day. And we've got some fantastic ideas. It started off quite small, basic stuff, such as carrying extra ammunition on the back, uh, ladders, crowbars for the infantry, so they didn't have to carry it in urban operations, they can come up and take it off the back of the tank. Um, we looked at different camouflage schemes, such as the uh, Berlin Squadron camouflage scheme you've got on here. Again, there's an example of that in the museum. Guess what, it still works, it's still effective. Um, and we've also looked at how we take advantage of uh, new types of cameras. So we've got some clever thermal stuff. The normal thermal cameras give you a two-tone. These are multicolour, but what's really clever, if someone jumps up from behind a wall and runs, it draws a little line around them, so you can see them running. So it attracts your attention to it. Um, what you would be able to see uh, would be a camera dangling from the front of the barrel. It's 180 degrees. What's clever about that is if you're in the urban environment and you go around the corner, you're kind of hoping no one's waiting for you around the corner. If you've got a camera on your barrel, nudge that around the corner, have a quick look before you then commit the tank and drive it around there. Um, we could go even further with this, maybe even in contemporary operations where you're doing counterinsurgency and you're operating in a busy city, something like gate analysis or facial recognition. So when you're looking onto those crowds in Basra, it'll pick out the known insurgent. He's over there. That would be great. So something we're looking at. There's also a number of cheap adaptations that could have utility. Uh, things like searchlights, infrared filters that could reassure, deter. Um, and none of these are new, they've all been used before, but you've sort of forgotten about them. So we're looking back at sort of how we could take more modern versions uh, and make them useful for us. Um, placing speakers on the arm, front of the armoured vehicles to support messaging campaigns. Think Kelly's Heroes or Ball, you could play a bit of music through them as well, maybe. That would be great. Um, and then uh, one of the most important things we need to do is get a lot better at friendly force identification, particularly when you consider the damaging consequences of blue on blue. Right, so a little bit of audience participation now. Um, someone shout out the name of an iconic World War II Allied tank. Sherman. Sherman, that'll do. We'll go, I like the Firefly because that's one of the ones the RTR designed, uh, but I'll go with the Sherman. So, uh, and then similarly, let's have uh, a iconic German World War II tank. Tiger one I'll go for. So we've got the Shermans, we've got the Tigers, dead easy. So presumably you'd be happy if you're out there in your Sherman with your friends in their Shermans going against the Germans in their Tigers. Pretty different tanks. If you had a fly fire, that would be better. I'd play Heckler. Um, but the punchline is, is you're able to easily identify the enemy. Now, consider this. You're back in your Sherman, your buddies are in their Sherman tanks and the Germans are in their Tiger ones. However, we've got some allies who before the war bought their vehicles from the Germans. So they're in Tiger ones as well. So you've got your Shermans, you've got your allies in their Tiger ones and you've got the enemy in their Tiger ones. And sooner or later you get to a stage where off in the distance, in the mist, you see a Tiger one going across. Not towards you, not away from you. What do you do? And the problem is, is we've got this now. So we've got allies such as Poland, who bought all their kit from Russia. So they are operating the same kit as our potential enemies. And we need to work out ways of, at night, in bad weather, in the urban environment, how do we establish who's friend uh, and who is foe? And this is, this is a big thing we're wrestling with at the moment. Um, maybe we need to look at developing a system that allows us to reduce barrel length. Uh, one young trooper suggested a telescopic barrel. Uh, I'm not sure that worked, but it's not a bad idea. Um, you know, and possibly do we need to adjust the calibre of our rounds? But could we do this in a way that allowed us to fight in the urban, but then if we needed to rock it straight into full bore engagements against tanks in the open, go straight back into the main arm? Don't know, something we're looking at. At the more advanced end of the spectrum, uh, we are uh, looking at a modification that's currently in uh, prototype of putting two uh, anti-tank guided weapons in a pod on top of the turret that give us reach out to eight kilometres. We've got uh, crazy little ground drones, big ones, small ones, that can wingman us, a sort of arti uh, artificial intelligence wingman. Some are electronic warfare, some are weaponized. Um, and there's a host of other things we can do with uh, long camera masks, and it's a project we're working on. But to conclude then, another quote that you can't see, um, Charles Darwin, and I think his quote applies perfectly to where we are at the moment. He said, it's not the most intellectual of the species that survives, it's not the strongest that survives. 
but it's the, the species that survives is the one that's able to adapt and adjust best to the changing environment it finds itself in. So it's not really about having the best tank or the best firepower, the best mobility and the best protection, although that definitely helps. Uh, what it is about is about having the best crew and being able to adapt your tank that you have at the moment to the fight that you're facing at the moment. And that depends on innovation, ingenuity and training. And I think that will be the thing that truly determines the true utility of tanks in modern warfare. Right, that, that is the lecture done. Uh, I'm now having to take uh, sort of uh, 10 or 15 minutes, bit of Q&A. Uh, again, talk about the presentation, talk about the regiment, uh, or tanks in general. Uh, and then just shoot me off when you've had enough. Yeah. Uh, how do you deal with threats of tanks that come from helicopters? How are those dealt with? So how do we deal with threats from helicopters? Yeah, so Okay, yeah, it's a good question. So, uh, there's a number of things. First of all, I... Uh, back to the mic. <laughs> um, so, the question was, is how do we deal with threats from helicopters and tank guarded weapons? So, the big threats. A um, couple of ways. First of all, the force package. We try not to drive around on our own if we can. So, you know, if we go into the city where we think there's going to be handheld anti-tank or uh, anti-tank guarded weapons, I would look to have dismounted infantry running alongside the armour, clearing the buildings as we went. And our role would be to take on tanks, bunkers and that sort of stuff. Um, how do we take on the helicopter piece? First of all, good use of grounds. When you're manoeuvring your unit or your tank uh, across the country or, or the urban environment, you use the ground. Again, you can hide from sight. Also, you can hide from radar staying in sort of low ground dips. Um, but again, force package, we'd be looking to take air defence with us. We're not running around on our own if we think there is uh, enemy aircraft out there. Uh, and then lastly, again, if you consider that the average fin round that comes out of a tank battle is going over two kilometres a second, shooting down a helicopter is not that tricky. Uh, and we train for it in our simulators. If you get a helicopter in your sights, you pull the trigger, unless he can move quicker than two kilometres a second, which he can't, uh, he's going to have a big hole uh, in his helicopter. So, does that answer the question? Brilliant. Okay. Um, so, how confident would I be to go into the future with the current gun uh, rather than sort of a new smoothbore or something like that? Um, two parts of the question again. Um, currently, the gun's pretty good. Um, unless you're talking about uh, top tier uh, prototype stuff like the Russian T14 Armata, that we know they've only got a handful of, they can't afford to mass produce them. Most of the average battle tanks kicking around, we can take on with what we've got now. But as I say, there's currently a life extension program uh, to Challenger 2 that is going to look at uh, significantly improving the lethality of the, uh, the vehicle. I won't talk too much about that, but you can sort of get an idea where I'm going. Um, gentlemen in the check shirt. Do you see a lot of the uh -huh. Is there a number of limits to the size of the tank? Uh, I've seen tall to fit in the tank. Uh, you should have seen me when I was a recce trip leader and the scimitars are even smaller. Uh, no, just take your boots off. Maybe you're strong. No, um, so technically there is there is an upper limit. Um, I hope you're not going to ask me to quote it. Um, but you know there are we've got some very tall officers in the regiment uh, and it's, it's not usually an issue. Gentlemen in the sunglasses. Um, best main battle tank in the world at the moment. Um, so, in regular service as a prototype, uh, in service, in service um, I think there's there's a sort of standard across. Um, I think where one is really good, um, it has weaknesses that another one is particularly good at. So you know, T80, T90, very fast. Um, but if I was getting shot at, I'd much rather be behind the Challenger 2 armor. Um, so I think it's very much you can see. Uh, through the design of the armour, what's important to the nation. And you know, again, you look at the Russian stuff, uh, certainly the stuff of the last 30 years, low, fast. It's all about getting across uh, the planes and getting across quickly. And actually, you can afford to take some casualties, so you don't need too much armour. Uh, so the Abram, they've just released a new one, uh, which is probably ahead of us in technology, because I think it's got uh, defensive aid systems fitted, uh, which are a key thing today with the proliferation of anti-tank weapons. Uh, so I've not personally used it, but I imagine with, uh, you know, Abrams is a great tank, but if you built on the technological enhancements to it, it's probably better than where we are at the moment. But as I say, we've got the life extension program, which is a couple of years down the line, and I imagine it's a case of doing that as countries advance their own armour. We don't all get uh, advanced at the same time. I'm a cab guy at the back.
Okay, just so I've got the context, what, what year was this in? So was it during the invasion or are we talking counterinsurgency? Say again? Okay, so, so a couple of years after the invasion. Um, so, so did they get bored? Um, I think someone was always getting a little bit bored, but um, uh, not, not to the extent where it was a problem. Uh, and in terms, of, uh, in terms of the sort of TTPs, um, I think early on in Iraq we learned that we weren't learning quickly enough, if that made sense and we became a bit more open to it. I think the Americans graded it. I think you learn a lot quicker than we do, or certainly you have done in the past. Um, but we ran up TTPs um, pretty quickly. Um, you know, things like don't stick still in the urban. That's a great lesson. You know, if you don't need to be physically there in the urban, don't be there. You need to be thinking, what effects am I having here? And if it's just being parked up outside a building with some movement on the roof, that's, that's probably not a great place to be. Um, but I think, I think the key thing to do is you've got to remember um, if you try and take your uh, ways of operating, your SOPs, from one fight to the next, so what works in Iraq is probably going to unhinge you Afghanistan. You've got to be willing to start over every time you, uh, you go somewhere new. Otherwise, you've got that arrogance that unhinge you. Does that answer the question? A bit warning. Gentlemen. Do you think there's a point at which the tanks will approve? Do I think there's a point at which the tanks will? Do you think there's a point in the future when tanks will have no crews? Uh, well, so we could do it now. We've got the technological ability to do it now if we wanted. Uh, however, there's a couple of problems with that. First of all, if you don't have a crew in a tank, you are reliant on the electronic link between that tank. And if you've got an adversary who's got a lot of great electronic warfare and he severs that link to the tank, you haven't got a tank anymore. Um, whereas getting rid of the crew is a lot more difficult. And also, as a society, we're kind of struggling with the idea of, of you know, taking direct action with uh, predator drones. I'm not sure we're, we're ready to let a machine uh, engage other human beings. I think we will still need a, a human being pulling the trigger for years to come before we say, yeah, I'm happy to go down the sort of Skynet Terminator route and just let those crack on. Um, so, follow on to that question, the perspective of the new Russian Chinese military and the Russian designs now are taking the crew out of the turret, putting them into a better protective hull. That the same so, so I think the Russian one's really interesting. Um, the uh, the reason they've dropped them out the turret and put them into the hull, so the turret's automated and the guys, the crew, all sits in the hull. They still do all the same jobs, but they're just lower down. Uh, and this is for crew survivability. And this is a first for the Russians because it was always previously a conscript army, and so the survivability wasn't that big of a deal because we've got loads of them. Um, but if you're looking at sort of expensive bits of armor and highly trained crews, making sure they survive actually pretty impossible. So, uh, uh, sorry, pretty important. So what they're doing there is trying to save money through having a tank that they can evacuate the crew if it's destroyed. Um, so we need to do that. Uh, I, I think the turret's pretty well protected. It's something we could look at. Um, again, I don't understand enough about the tech to understand what you would trade out in order to do that. Not a great answer, sorry. Yes? Uh, well, there's one behind you. Uh, well, yeah, I appreciate the uh, I, I, I don't see the difference. I, I genuinely don't see the difference. Um, you know, there was big fanfare. Sorry, the question was, what do I feel about women in tanks? So there was a big fanfare uh, when this came in. Um, I don't know if you know, in the last year or two, uh, women are now in, uh, in the Army Corps and in the infantry. For us, it's, it's not a problem. We've always had uh, female uh, reaming mechanics, so we've worked closely. Um, I don't really think we've noticed uh, a change. It's a little bit different, but it's no, no better, no worse. It's just more officers, more soldiers. It works fine. Sorry. Yes, gentlemen, look on. Your current armor. Your current armor. So can our current armour stop any enemy projectiles? Um, it's, it's, quite, it's a, quite a broad question. Um, a, you'd have to understand all the enemy projectiles that are out there at the moment. Um, things like top attack missiles, no, because they're almost on the side, that comes straight through. 
Um, if you're talking about most uh, enemy tank rounds, potential enemy tank rounds, yes, probably, but all sorts of things come into play. So, you know, if you're diagonally angled onto the, uh, uh, the incoming rounds, you're effectively increasing your armor, increasing chance of ricochet. So th there's a million one factors. Uh, I would hope so if I'm in the tank is the, uh, is the quickest answer. Uh, does the RTR have any capacity with do we have any plans for? Climate change. Sorry. Do we have any plans for dealing with effective climate change? No, that's not something the regiment's tasked with. But, you know, that would exist in a much higher echelon within the army, probably Minister of Defence, but that's not something we do at regiment level. Okay, uh, one more. Uh, esoteric question. The fact is now we've reduced to one World Tag Regiment, not even the first. What is the correct designation of your regiment? The Royal Tank Regiment. It's not the Royal Tank Regiment. That is not correct. Okay. <laughs> I will, I'll, take, I'll go and look it up straight after this. I promise. I'll find the RSM will be mortified if I got it wrong. Uh, any more, three more? Right, last one, lady at the back. Uh, chat next to the lady at the back. Um, I, I don't have the detail and I'm afraid I can't talk about the detail life extension program purely because it's still in the uh, commercial space. So give it another couple of months uh, and there'll be a lot more out there in public domain, I'd imagine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, I, I can probably speak for all of us that we tend to bizarrely have more access to eyewitness accounts of the Second World War than we do of what's been happening in armour today. It's been an absolute delight to be brought up to speed by Jim as, a, as an authoritative voice of modern armoured warfare. So please join me in uh, thanking our speaker, Phil Jim Howard. We're just going to take another couple of minutes break. If you want to either acquire liquids or evacuate liquids,